Thank you, uh, Woon, our Master of Ceremony. And now we are actually into the real highlight because this morning we had a lot of speeches that were the highlight, but this is a greater highlight, I believe, uh, because we're going to hear from the icons. Uh, in fact, whether you receive the awards or not, Datuk Reza, <laughs> you are certainly an icon. <laughs> we have an we have award recipient here. We have Datuk Reza. Certainly is one that will befit any icon. And also we have uh, Dr. Uh, Shahir uh, of Invest Para, who is very knowledgeable, very much involved in all the investment uh, activities from the early days until today, right? So the session today, I mean this session, it is about revitalizing Perak's economy and charting the future. And with that, cultivating the ideal investment climate. Uh, we are a little bit behind time, but we are still given the one hour. So I'm going to skip the introduction, but the good thing is this, all the uh, panelists or speakers here are those these distinguished personalities that actually would not need much introduction. And further details are available in the program book. I would like to actually ask you to refer to the program book for our uh, the background of our distinguished uh, speakers here. And the format is this. Uh, I would like to invite each of the speakers to share their views based on this topic uh, for about 10 minutes each. Within the 10 minutes. After that, then we will have questions uh, and deliberation based on the questions and also to open the session to the floor for any further question. All right? So with that, it is really my honor to invite our first speaker, Tan Sri Datuk Sri Lee Oi Hien, to share with us uh, his thoughts and wisdoms. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wei, Chairman. Yeah. And uh, I just want to congratulate uh, KSI, MICCI, and the Para Academy for your initiative in hosting this very uh, meaningful conference for revitalizing our Para economy and also to chart our future. When I see the three keywords at the uh, behind the board. Um, which is to recover, to reset, and resilience. I cannot help thinking about the past. How much Barak has been left behind? As been said, we were from team mining, and uh, we now have seen how our young people have to go to KL, or elsewhere to find the job. So Perak has become uh, more like a more elderly uh, city. So we need to recover from this. And I believe this is the season for Perak. But then when you come to reset, I think we have been very encouraged that our uh, Royal Highness, Tuanku Perak, Sultan Nas Nasrin Shah, has been setting the stage and the culture necessary for the reset. And I think also this is also emphasized by our young Ahmad Muhammad Prime Minister. So yesterday, in the conference in Invest Malaysia, he re-emphasized again. Zero tolerance for misconduct and corruption. We have to get rid of the corruption. He talked about ill-gotten gains. Bribery has no place in this region, in this uh, country, nation. And he talked about good governance and the safeguard for investors' protection. And I think without the right culture, I don't think we are going to recover. Right? So I think what is past is past. 
But I think going forward, Perak needs to have this culture, right? And when we talk about resilience, is the recovery going to be very hard for Perak? I don't think very difficult. Uh. Number one, I think the past few years already, we have already seen some recovery in Perak, right? Some resilience. The, even in the town of Yipo, where it used to be a dead town, now we're seeing it to be much more lively. Uh, people are coming here for tourism. You have got three flights from Singapore already. You've got a very rich hinterland, you know, in the sense of, uh, of the, from, uh, from uh, Lumut, from Bangkok, to Cameron's, to, to, the, to the Greek area, yeah. And so we are seeing some uh, recovery in Perak, yeah. But I think the issue is how do we accelerate the recovery? And uh, as I said, with this culture, investor coming to Perak must have confidence. Confidence in the government, confidence that things are going to be done properly without bribery, okay? Confidence that the state assets will be more uh, transparent in giving away because we have also seen in the past, you know, many of our so-called uh, use, usable state land has been uh, privatized in a quiet manner and all those things. And these things should not happen again. Uh, yeah. Um, I think in terms of uh, Perak is very well placed, as I said. We have got the Lumut port. I think it's been mentioned that uh, we, are, we are near, we are in Tanjung Malim, which is going to be the epicenter of the motor car industry and other uh, related industry. And hopefully an ecosystem will be set up there, uh, much like the ecosystem that's already in Penang for the electronics. Huh? Paribunta may be, uh, may be receiving some of the spin-off from the technology and the, the big IT industry, industry there. We have also Lumut port. Lumut is a very deep water port. In fact, one of the natural deep water port that you do not need to dredge. Yeah. But unfortunately, of course, we do not have containers there, but containers can be always, uh, station can be sent up there, but more, more like a feeder port to Port Klang. So I don't think we can realistically think that the uh, Lumut can be, uh, uh, alternative port to, uh, the, the Port Klang area. So we have to face realism. But again, it's a deep water port, you know, and there's many benefits of deep water port. You can have a jetty anywhere and you'd have to go very far to go into the deep water. Yeah. So I think that's an uh, advantage. We have to think about FDIs that need the deep water. They need to bring bulk inside. Okay. And I think in terms of infrastructure, to me, what is very important is uh, we should be thinking about a highway from Ipo, linking Ipo to the West Coast, uh, the BCE, West Coast Expressway, and also to Lumut. Because now from us to go to Stiawan, we imagine we start counting how many red lights we have to pass through. I think about 20 old red lights. Even to go to Stiawan take one and a half hours. With the highway, is a very different. And tourism is very, very big in, in, can be very big in Ipo. Currently, we're only coming from Singapore, right? From Singapore. If we just extend the airport a little bit, you know, I think there was a study done where you have to require about 20, 30 units of houses, lengthen the highway a bit, to provide safety, actually, 
we we already good enough to have the narrow body seven three seven or the Airbus coming in, yes. yeah. And very soon we can have Bangkok, Hong Kong, the regional areas, you know. So let's not maybe a big airport is something for the future, future lah. But let's solve the immediate problem, bring more tourism from the other region into Perak. So by doing the airport, I think it will be a big plus to uh, Perak. Uh, the other thing is the when a lot of tourists now are coming through uh, from KL, but when we go back to KL on especially on Sunday afternoon or Raya, it takes us four hours because it's jammed. And the problem is our road from uh, Ipoh to Sungkai area is still four lanes, two lanes on each side. Okay, So I think they should, it's high time they widen it. Lah. So that all the way to KL, you got the, you got the three lane. Lah. I think these are the priorities that you need to set to, in terms of the infrastructure for for the Perak region. Because in this current budget, I think our Prime Minister already has uh, approved in this current budget to lengthen the, the widen the highway in parts of Johor already, right? So I think he approved 600 or million or something. Like that. Yeah, I, can't, I can't remember figure. But suddenly, you know, we... We have uh, in Perak, we have got the PM, we got the DPM, we got the so many mi- key ministers. So this, I think, this is a time for Perak, la. <laughs> So we have the uh, we have to leave our uh, the, the Reza to to think about it, la. <laughs> So to make sure it happen <laughs> because you are in the in the inner room, la, with all the. <laughs> MB, uh, all that, uh, so, uh, so I think uh, maybe I'll just uh, for the moment I'll just uh, stop here and let uh, Wow, well, thank you uh, thank you so much uh, for your this uh, the first uh, speech uh, Dan Sri uh, of course, you know, for those who may uh, not know enough about Dan Sri he actually run one of the biggest uh, plantation agriculture empire in Malaysia and the whole region, uh, KLK, right? So certainly a lot of wisdom there. And what I picked up is this, you know, the culture of good governance, good conduct, it is essential as a foundation for any growth, any investment to take place. So along with that, then how do we reset and bring back the tourists? And because it is actually the kind of low-hanging fruits, there are a lot for Perak to offer, as I have picked up uh, from Tanzri. And then subsequently, really to use uh, infrastructure uh, as the one of the impetus for the new area of uh, investment and growth, like, for example, to capitalize on the Lumut deep port uh, capability. So there are a lot more that could happen over there. Uh, and airport is a one, perhaps more mid-term, but it could be shorter than mid-term, I hope, uh, that will bring a new level of connectivity, as pointed out by Tan Sri. And one last point that I picked up is about expanding the highways uh, which links within the Perak, like Ipoh to Stiawan, as well as from you know Ipoh down to KL to uh, to have a chance to widen that to three lanes and so on. Yeah. Uh, just, just also, uh, yes. Just also one more point. I think is that once we set the ecosystem to be uh, attractive for the investment or new entrepreneurs or new SMEs in IPO or the, in the new service sector, IPO have got very good natural resources in terms of human uh, resources. We have uh, so many things that come up from IPO. IPO Town Coffee. Yes. Uh, yes. IPO Town Coffee. You look at the biscuit shops in the whole IPO. 
the small thing, garam chicken, all those things, that has now become a, from a local product, has now well known throughout the whole region. Yeah. So I think we set the catalyst in, uh, within Para. I think there will be the talents within Para, not to speak about the resources that we have. You know, the ecotourism and so many possibilities they are available. Para, I think the, the private sector, uh, together, s- s- after being stimulated by the, with the catalyst provided by the state, I think it will bring also many local investment also, beside the foreign investment. Yeah. Wow. Well, yes. Uh, thank you. So the, the last point about setting the right environment as a catalyst for entrepreneurship innovation, right? Thank you, uh, Tan Sri. And I'd like to move on to our second very distinguished speaker, Dato Reza, also uh, our old and young friend. He looked young, uh, though he's an old friend with me, uh, those days in the MSC, right? Uh, yes, Dato Reza, please. Thank you, Dato Wei. Uh, Tan Sri, I think you've, you've set the tone uh, very nicely for, for this. Uh. Um, okay, um, first of all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, my experience of, of Perak, per se, is that uh, things will have to be uh, done. We have to go forward with feet firmly planted on the ground. Uh, I am from Perak. I don't speak like you because I'm not from Ipoh. I speak northern dialect because I'm from Asam Kumbang. Wajong Taiping Lai Okay. So, uh, anyway, uh, these things, okay, with the infrastructure that we have had, uh, uh, that, that Tansi has mentioned, uh, that we need to actually put forward, um, there were things that we need to actually look uh, ahead in terms of what would be the key advantages that uh, Perak has. Um, again, all this while we have been looking at why, why Penang, why not Perak? Why Penang, why not Perak? Kalau belah utara lah. Huh? Um, the, the, but, but the thing is, uh, Perak is a long state. We don't even have the same dialect. Okay? The north has an ecosystem that mimics Penang. If you look at uh, uh, Parit Buntak, if you look at Bagasrai, you look at uh, Kemunting, uh, their industries have have one uh, Kiblat lah. Yeah? Which is Penang. Yeah. Not so when you go to Kuala Kangsa, when you go to Ipoh. Now, what would be, and, and if you go south, as mentioned earlier, you know the automotive, uh, uh, aspirations that we have. And you know also the spillovers that we have from Slango. Now, I'm going to talk to you about a few things. One is, I think areas that we can give more attention to. Uh, uh, two, and these have been set up already in uh, Dr. Maisara's uh, Perak Sejahtera 2030. Um, first, green technology. Uh, in Perak Sejahtera 2030, it talks about the sustainable use of natural resources. And, and in this case, uh, green technology, we have uh, solar, we have hydro, and we have the other carbon offset stuff that we can do that few other states can follow. And then we have minerals. Minerals, uh, all this while, most companies actually do the mining. Let's see, yeah? do mining. Yeah, but uh, a few things have happened recently. One is, I think you saw smart paint coming uh, to the state of Perak to actually produce paint. And because they want to use the limestone, uh, and this ties with uh, a, a statement made by Tuanku Sultan on the 25th of August, 2021, um, where uh, he said, roughly translated, of course he says it in a better way, lah. Uh, cukup lah mining saja. Now we have to look at the possibilities of going midstream and downstream in terms of adding value to our products because these are our resources. Okay, the next thing that you will see, lepah uh, raya perhaps, uh, will be the groundbreaking for the factory of uh, Jinjing, 
Jinjing actually uh, came to us. Jinjing is the biggest glass manufacturer in China. They've uh, come to us not to produce glass, but to actually to come after our minerals, to do midstream and downstream processing, to send the minerals to Kulim uh, to do glass. So minerals actually is one of the areas because minerals enable the state to attract upstream players for batteries, for fuel cells, for wind, for traction and motors, for photovoltaics, uh, for uh, robotics, for 3D printing, and also for uh, microprocessors. So these are crucial, uh, minerals are crucial components eh, for these things. Um, I was introduced to Jinjing by First Solar. Yeah, by First Solar. Because Jinjing makes the glass for their solar panels. Okay, now, in terms of green technology and minerals, these are sectors that we can uh, look forward to, uh, where the state can attract resource-seeking investors. Because there are three categories. Uh, satu, you have the market-seeking investors. Usually, market-seeking investors will not come to Malaysia. Then you have the investors that come to Penang, to Selangor, to Johor. These are the efficiency-seeking investors. Tetapi, in Perak, you have a niche, which is resource-seeking investors. Uh, we had some hiccups with the land and all that, but they waited. And they waited, and now they are ready. So, and the factory is a green factory where the only uh, waste that will come out of the factory is human waste. So, this is a, new, a, a unique thing. And we now need to focus on resource-seeking investors. Then, uh, Tansi, again, you mentioned about the roads, yeah? yeah. mentioned about the accessibility. Uh, this is something crucial for us because we must now zoom in on the business potential of the logistics sector in light of the current global trends. Uh, now, people are going head over heels in trying to fulfill customer demands and customer expectations. And we need to look at the potential that we have in uh, Lumut Port. Uh, something has happened recently where we signed uh, uh, an agreement with the Port of Antwerp. Yeah, we signed an agreement with the Port of Antwerp. This is not a memorandum of, of understanding. As you may remember, in Pankor Dialogue, we would sign like berbelas-belas MOUs and nothing ever happened. So again, kali ini kita berpijak di bumi nyata. Kita sign satu saja. Tapi agreement. Yeah? And we are looking at the potential of developing the Lumut Maritime Industrial City or LUMIC. This is not a port. Uh, uh, I think, Tansi, you made a valid point. Okay, this is not a port. This is a maritime industrial development area. It is like an uh, industrial park, but just using the Lumut Maritime Terminal to provide value-added services to the industrial area. It is different. And why did the port of Antwerp like Lumut? It is because both are river ports. It is because both have industrial uh, developments around the area. And since, uh, I think they had the session here, if I'm not mistaken, where the ambassadors from the European Union came over, uh, and then the French and the Belgians came over, and then the Belgians came over with two people from Antwerp, and the rest is history. Okay, now, from a regional perspective, lah, I think there's a need for, for us to realize, again, um, for Perak to realize that each region is unique. Each region has its own strengths, its own value propositions, its own idiosyncrasies. And for example, in the north of Perak, the north of Perak can actually take advantage of the engineering-based ecosystem arising from the 50 years of industrial evolution in Penang and the industrial ev evolution of the south of Kedah. This is especially important that we have to capture, uh, as it was announced by the Penang state government, that there is no more land 
no more meaningful industrial land left in seberang perai. The central region pun ada dia punya own uh, strengths, its own value propositions as I mentioned earlier. And the south of Pera is poised to play a key role in complementing the Selangor economic juggernaut. So this is this is the point. And uh, again, tadi I think a lot of people talk, uh, spoke about the uh, diaspora, about uh, people uh, going out. Eh? How do we retain talent? Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've never worked in, in Perak before. This is my first job in Ipoh. Eh? Uh, even in the old days, Perak people have opted to work uh, outside the state as per Dr. Adib punya point tadi. So, uh, I'll give you some examples of people that we may know. Datuk Wira Azhar Abdul Hamid. Dr. Hari Narayana. Datuk Rafiq Marekan. Encik Zakri Khe. Encik Asri Hassan Sabri. Encik Lim Simket. And Encik Nizam Nazri. They are all Actually, not from Perak. They are all not from Taiping. They are all from Asam Kumbang. <laughs> Can you imagine Asam Kumbang having this? What? Apa tah lagi? The whole of Perak. Can you imagine this? There's Asam Kumbang. You know, that's the CEO of uh, Maybank Islamic, chairman of uh, Motorola, USM, uh, Datuk Wira Azhar Abdul Hamid. You, you know who he is. Uh, Zakri Khe, Alliance, punya CEO now chairman. Asri Hassan Sabri, Selcom, your strongman. Lim Simket is a new ship, punya CEO. Now he's somewhere in Norway. And Nizam Nazri is the CEO of Nation Debt Ventures. And all from Asam Kumbang. So, but they've not worked in 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 Perak before. Because tak ada, tak ada peluang. Uh, and the challenge now, how do we address this, this diaspora issue, how do we address the brain drain and overcome the socio-economic barriers? Because human capital is key for this. My take, ladies and gentlemen, is you need private sector participation. Uh, the private sector, both local and foreign companies, need to play a key role uh, untuk menyediakan peluang-peluang pekerjaan. Uh, and more work. Uh, this means yeah, that the government federal government and the state government must, must, must play a role or must continue to play a role of enabler and facilitator and help to provide an enabling support ecosystem for the private sector to thrive and to prosper. Thank you. Uh, wow. There, there are a lot of gems and nuggets there. So the Tok Reza has uh, spoken about, you know, to start with, you know, we are flanked by the Penang and Selangor. So it seems that these two places have been developing and neglecting Pera, but actually it's not. He alluded to, actually, not only spillover, but we can really attract a lot more than just a spillover to really take advantage of the proximity to the various industrial centres, up north and down south. Uh, and he has given a very strong example on development of green tech because uh, there's a head start in hydro and solar, and also to learn about this resource-seeking investment, especially Perak has a lot of minerals. So those numerous examples has been very inspiring. Uh, so, of course, from resource-seeking, market-seeking, efficiency-seeking, this is where we need to make a choice, right? Yeah. And then the expansion in terms of Lumut Maritime Industrial uh, Area, that is certainly fascinating. Uh, we foresee a lot more coming. And the last part that he talked about, uh, you know, all these great personalities, leaders in various industries, they don't come from the whole Pera, but from his hometown. <laughs> his village, all right. So now just, in, just imagine we have so many villages, including a lot of the new villages, you add up the diaspora, the power is scary to say the least, right? Thank you so much for sharing this wisdom. And we shall move on to uh, Dr. Uh, Shahir.
uh, to share with us uh, his thoughts about this topic. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Datuk Wei. Uh, yang berbahagia our distinguished guest, Tan Sri Lee uh, dan Datuk Reza. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to extend my special thankful to the organizer uh, for inviting me to represent Invest Perak. Uh, to this, uh, uh, to be part of the speakers uh, for this uh, session this morning, and then uh, from uh, my personal pers- perspective, the topic of our discussion today is very important in order for us to determine what we are going to be in the next five or ten or even twenty years. So let me start uh, by uh, briefly explain about the history of Malaysia economic journey. Over for, for the last uh, since independent, because the topic of our discussion is charting the future. In order for us to chart the future, we need to look back the history. So and then we have to learn from the what the mistake that we we we, we have before in order for us to move forward. If you look looking back at history, uh, it is proof that Malaysia has successfully transformed from a predominantly agriculture based industry in 1960s towards industrialization in 1990s. Uh, this statement was further fortified uh, by the fact that uh, in 1965, our Malaysian economy uh, was uh, largely depend on agriculture, which amounted at uh, 31.5% compared to manufacturing only 10.4%. Nevertheless, uh, this figure swept in 1995 after the industrialization coming up and The manufacturing sectors has become a major contributor for the economy, for the Malaysian economy, uh, contributed around 32.2%, while agriculture sectors contribute only 13.1%. And during, uh, in the 1990s, uh, with the large, with the injection of large, uh, amount of FDI during that time, uh, our economy has grown substantially, uh, between from the early until the mid of 1990s, with the average GDP growth for Malaysia is around 8 to 10% per year. Uh, and then, uh, indeed, uh, during that time, uh, Malaysia uh, was known uh, as a haven or better known as a truly preferred investment destination because of the drawbacks that our neighboring country has. Indeed, uh, during that time, uh, if we can still remember, our neighboring countries, especially Vietnam and Indonesia, most of them were not among the top investment destination for investors. It is due to because uh, Vietnam and Indonesia during that time, uh, they were politically unstable. They, uh, they have lack of developed infrastructure. They have uh, some problem with the legal framework, land title, everything. And then also, they had a uh, weak investment policy. But Malaysia, on the other hand, uh, we start, we begin to adopting a liberal economic policy and we start to emulate uh, Singapore and the Western countries to develop excellent infrastructure to fulfill the requirement by the investors. Uh, however, as the time goes by, I think, I think we, we can see uh, those countries, uh, the Indonesia or even uh, Vietnam, everything, those countries have changed tremendously. And nowadays, we can see that investors nowadays, they have many options to invest in this region. In other words, uh, the competition among the Southeast Asia countries Uh, have become stiff. So moving forward, I think uh, it is high time for us uh, to dictate and to determine uh, what is the, the competitive advantage that we can uh, create, especially in the case of Perak, even though like our distinguished guests uh, just now, uh, Datuk Reza and Tansi touched uh, uh, very much about the re- uh, natural resources, everything, because uh, by having the natural resources, it is good, but we need more. We need to do more to ensure that Our, our mineral resources can be used, can be utilized to produce high-end products. The, the conservative, uh, the existing mineral that we have, for example, that we have a limestone, we have a kaolin, we have a silica sand and so on. And uh, looking at the current situation, yes, we do have companies like Loas from, German, uh, Loas from Belgium make use of our uh, limestone to produce a quick lime and hydrated lime for water treatment. We also have... a uh, Omya from Switzerland and also Imeris from uh, France uh, make use of our limestone to produce calcium carbonate. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, there is a one uh, resource, new, new uh, natural resource that uh, we found 
we should uh, call it as a NREE, non-radioactive uh, rare earth element, or better known as iron absorption clay. But it is uh, quite uh, important, of course, because all those resources uh, was entrusted by God to us, and it depends on us, on the state that we mentioned by Tan Sri. We need a good governance, we need a responsibility person, we, we need to make use, utilize our resources wisely uh, to make Perak grow and flourish. Okay, that's all from him. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shahir. So you have uh, certainly given us a good background, a run-through of a historical uh, account of how we have been growing uh, in the past, right? And we were ahead of the neighboring countries because we have started earlier in uh, attracting the foreign direct investment and all the incentives and environment were right, but the rest have actually caught up already. So moving forward, we would have to find a new ways. And then the, the resource base is still one important area because we have some natural strength there. And then, but we must also make sure that we take care of the, some of the, um, like you use the, some of the non-radioactive kind of uh, uh, the areas of processing and so on, right? So I think that will set us thinking about the direction. What kind of uh, investment from local as well as uh, foreign that should we attract into Para? Right? Well, uh, well, for your information, uh, Para State Government uh, has endorsed uh, Para Industrial Plan or better known as a Plan Per Industrial Para uh, P3. Uh, P3 actually is a a uh, long-term plan covering a period of for 10 years, starting from 2021 until 2030. I think uh, it is good for us, for Investpera, to have uh, this plan uh, because it is easier, easier for us to set up our KPI to enter investment. So, under this plan, the P3 plan, uh, it is said that manufacturing sector will contribute uh, at least 25% for Pera State GDP uh, with the current level at the 20.1%. Then to answer your question, among the main sectors that we are promoting very much is uh, first is electrical and electronics. Uh, second one, secondly, is uh, automotive and mineral-based industry, uh, halal industry as well as digital economy and uh, manufacturing related, related services. Uh, taking E&E &E as an example, even though uh, Penang has a better position uh, to promote E&E &E because uh, uh, in that state, they have a robust and mature E&E uh, &E ecosystem, but the fact remains, uh, Perak also is uh, quite strong in the E&E &E sectors uh, with the presence of uh, multinational companies. For example, we have a Finisa 2 seeds from US uh, producing an optical transceiver in Perak. We also have a Murata Electronics from Japan. And the current one, we have a SP Power from Singapore. So meaning that uh, uh, apart, from, apart from the foreign MNC, we also have a local, existing local uh, company that also contribute very much for the E&E &E sector in Perak. For example, we have Custom and Unisem uh, undertaking uh, testing and packaging activities. Uh, on top of E&E uh, &E sectors, one of the uh, promoted sectors uh, in Perak is uh, uh, automotive. Uh, when we talk about automotive, uh, in, uh, particularly we, we, we are promoting very much uh, the, on the EV, on electric vehicles. Based on my personal observation, even though the EV terms has become a buzzword and everybody keep talking about EV, promoting EV. Every state wanted to, to promote EV. But the facts remain, based on my personal perspective, EV industry in Malaysia is still at the infant stage. Meaning that, uh, based on my, my informa information that I, I had, uh, there are not many companies involved in producing uh, EVs, manufacture uh, EVs uh, products in Malaysia, except one or two. For example, the companies that are already involved in EV industry is uh, Samsung SDI Energy. They have invested around 1 billion ringgit in Inggris Milan to produce uh, EV battery. Other than that, yes, uh, Volvo and uh, Mercedes Benz has made announcement. They wanted to assemble an EV car in Shah Alam and in Pekan respectively, but it is in, in the planning. So moving forward, uh, by having a Proton uh, Tanya Malim, because uh, the state government has invited Proton uh, to present to the MMK uh, last a few weeks, uh, and then uh, Proton... Uh, told us that they are very committed to work together with Gili uh, to develop the Automotive High Tech Valley, AHTV. So the state government will give full support for Proton uh, to develop this uh, HTV because it's going to be a stepping stone uh, for the state to promote 
more automotive, especially in regards with the EV and EV related industry in Perak. Wow, fantastic. So EE uh, certainly will continue be, to be an uh, important area. Automotive is really em emerging, up and coming, and it's going to be very vibrant because of the, le the lead by the Proton and Gili, uh and digital economy that you mentioned as well. All right. So thank you very much. So with that, I think we'd like to uh, begin with some of the questions. Um, you see, the background is this. Our... Perak State is very fortunate right now. We hear that we have Prime Minister, we have a Deputy Prime Minister, we have a Minister of Human Resource, we have Minister of Science and Technology, we have Minister of Housing Development. Is that all? Or one more? Foreign Minister. Right? So six cabinet members. That's within, uh, from uh, Pera. Now, let's also zoom out to see in a macro picture, there is this trade war that is continuing, the West and some of the East, like particularly China. There is this inflation that's creeping around the world. There is also that Ukraine war that also exacerbates many of those geopolitical reconfiguration. So we find that the supply chain are being localized, being regionalized. And the RCEP has come into the full formation already. The regional economic, um, uh, what, comp comprehensive economic partnership. While ASEAN is also continuing, though not as dynamic as we wish. With this backdrop, how could PERA actually take advantage in drawing the right kind of partners to co-develop uh, Para, drawing on the strength of uh, so-called the strength of cabinet members that we have right now. I, I would like to have all the panelists, all the speakers. Yeah, maybe maybe I I, I just uh, give it a shot now. Yes. Um, we we already see we already see uh, because of the current um, geopolitical backdrop, um, new things have emerged. Uh, suddenly, the European Union has taken an interest in uh, actually not putting its eggs in one basket. Sebab tu dia pemain sini. And because of that also, uh, we have to step up our offerings, our value propositions, because my thinking is this would be an interesting time uh, for the state of Perak to leverage on the presence of the cabinet members to help ensure that uh, our initiatives materialize accordingly. Um, we have to use this uh, opportunity, this time, um, by not, uh, I, sorry, I, I have to say this, uh, by not putting forward insane proposals. I cringe you know, at some of the proposals. Uh, we have to put forward real proposals. We have to put forward something for the federal government to chew on. For example, uh, in the 11th measure plan, I think we had uh, submitted a proposal for four airports. So we have more airports than Thailand. Contohnya. <laughs> and of course, all four got rejected. Lah. Uh, now, now, the thing is, we have, to take this uh, this, we have to take this opportunity. We have this advantage now. We have to do it properly. Buat benda dengan betul. Buat benda dengan tepat. Then, to, uh, and, and of course, at the same time, uh, two things that we have to look at. Yeah? Satu, uh, uh, I, I worked on this with uh, Dr. Shahir Punya, uh, previous CEO, to have a proper due diligence filtration process. So, but I think the moment I came in, di, di Perak, banyaklah company-company macam nama Selera Cepoh, Selera Berhad. You know, come to me with a hundred ringgit paid up to do like three thousand acres in Bagan Datuk, uh, for example. These are all insane punya, punya, punya things. And, and at the same time, we need to have a mechanism to navigate properly to ensure we avoid past failures because this is our time. Rugi lah kalau kita fall flat on our faces because we tripped over our own shoelaces. 
And we're talking about, of course, satu, the need to avoid over-ambitious projects. Again, 3,000 acres, billion-billion pelaburan di Bagan Datuk with a 100 ringgit paid up company, SDO. SDO means sure die one. Okay. Uh, and we also need to manage things from becoming disjointed, uh, arising from a lack of continuity in planning, in implementation. Uh, third is we need to have a we need, we need to have proper transparency, proper governance to ensure that opportunities that we have at this point of time are not squandered. Tidak dipersiasiakan. I am worried about that. We have to really, really be conscious in terms of managing this. And I think one of the key uh, six uh, agenda items of uh, Perak Sejahtera 2030 is about having the right governance. So that's it. That's my, my start. Lah. I'm sorry it doesn't sound so positive, but these, these are things that we must do to take advantage of our current situation. Uh, I think, like you say, both feet grounded so then we can really move forward. Right? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Reza. Maybe we, we can hear from Dr. Shahir about this. Uh, the sectors that you know we could actually invite to invest. Uh, yes, I think uh, in regards with the question on the, yeah, uh, the, the having a Prime Minister, uh, from my personal perspective, yes, by having the Prime Minister, the DPM or, state, you know, or even a state, uh, Cabinet Minister from Perak, it is good. It gives a full advantage for us in respect of getting more budget, more allocation, yeah, more uh, projects to be in Perak. So the question is, what we are, what are we going to do to ensure that those budget, those allocation can be smoothly implemented in Perak? That's the, the point number one. And then there's the second part, we have to accept the reality that the federal government nowadays, they have also have a limited sources of income. Meaning that definitely uh, the federal government will prioritize the project based on the urgent need. So having said that, uh, we are from state government. We need to determine and we need to prioritize what is the, the, the low-hanging fruits that we need to pick within the term because of five years, uh, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not longer. So within these five years, we have to determine what is the low-hanging fruit that we need to pick uh, to make sure that Perak will, uh, will grow and spur. And then, uh, because I'll take an example, one of the main projects that I think uh, from Invest Perak perspective that we need, uh, we really need help from the federal, federal government is to develop a new industrial park. Because like uh, been mentioned by Datuk Wei just now, about the trade war, everything, yes, because of the trade war, Invest Perak, and even Maida and NCIA, we received a lot of inquiries from companies. They wanted to set up uh, the, the plan in, in, in Perak. However, we found difficulties uh, to, re to, re to help them to relocate their projects to be in Perak because we have a lack of developed industrial park. For example, yesterday, uh, we brought a company from the US. They wanted to produce high-end product, the glass shrinkers, and this is a very uh, high-end product. But the thing is, uh, 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 they, are, they start comparing what uh, Perak, what the Pinay, and what Kedah is offering. So uh, in order for us to, to attract a quality investment, one of the most important key that we need to resolve is we need to uh, create, develop, develop in national park. And I strongly believe uh, with the uh, strong effort by PKMP under the leadership of Datuk Reza, I think uh, we can work together to ensure that Perak can develop, start develop the new national park uh, either in, in Ipoh or either in, uh, in Penang to ensure that we can enjoy the spillover effect from the global trade war. Wow, thank you. To attract all the new investment, we need Datuk Reza. That's the, the, the message. <laughs> no, industrial park. <laughs> an enabler, yeah. Yes, thank you. And I'd like to invite uh, Tan Sri to share your wisdom. You know, at the backdrop of the geopolitical contest. Uh, yeah, I think those are very good points made by my two uh, uh, cool speakers. I think geopolitics is here. Okay, we see. So I think a lot of uh, Chinese companies also want a base here, you know, meet in Malaysia so that you can export to 
the other party in the world, right? So I think this is beneficial for us. But how do we we got to make things conducive for them to come, you know? And maybe by word of mouth, by recommendation, and all those things. Once we make them conducive to come here, uh, Barack also has got a. We we got to be realistic, lah. Like um, Doctor Reza say, don't expect insane uh, proposals to come here, lah. Maybe the SMEs, the supply, the SMEs goods that doesn't need a, to be located next to the port. You know, those are the industry that we should be looking at. And natural resources, we got plenty of silica here, as you mentioned. You know, so those resources that needs your so industries that need your resource-based industries, so they have got to move here because you got the resource and all those things. So I think there is uh, good opportunities for for this whole region, ASEAN, this whole ASEAN region. Singapore, I think, is just the head office be there, too expensive. Thailand, Thailand's uh, attractiveness. But here, our legal system, our infrastructure, our land is also very well defined, you know, very well defined. So I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, and people trust our people here. You know, that's why a lot of the IT industry set up their R&D here. So that we put the R&D here, you put it in China, I think tomorrow it might be copied already. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think it's the word trust, I think, is also very important. Wow, this is very powerful. You know, Pera has one, uh, we call intangible asset that we have not been marketing so well yet is trust. And the trust is also rooted not just in people, but also in a system, like the legal system, predictability and all this. Great point, uh, Tan Sri. Uh, we come to the end already. i just like to uh, invite all the speakers to give a concluding kind of vision moving forward, right? With all those suggestions that you have made, assuming we can execute all of them, so how do you envisage Para in 10 years' time by 2030? Can you describe the picture that you can see in 10 years' time, assuming all those can be executed? Uh, could we have like each one to spend like one minute to describe the picture of 2030, please? How about Dr. Shahir? Yeah, let's start. Uh, well, actually... Uh Actually, actually, it is uh, my hope uh, to see that uh, by having uh, provided that uh, we have a strong effort. First, we need a strong political will. We need a strong commitment from a civil servant. Uh, we need a uh, strong support from private sectors in order for us uh, to attract more quality investment. So, like I mentioned just now, uh, now Pera, we are moving towards to promote high quality investment. So, in order for us to promote high quality investment, there are many things that we need to resolve. One, uh, uh, one of the major components that we need to, to highlight is about the giving of incentive to the companies. So that's why the existing incentive provided by MADA and SIA, either or, uh, finance status to IT, it is very pertinent. But uh, more importantly, the most, the most very, very, very important for investor, I think uh, Mr. John, chairman of MSCI, will agree with me, the things that uh, uh, become a major concern by investor is ease of doing business. Because, if, uh, because the timing is, uh, uh, is a money for them, if the state government, we can't resolve the red tape issues, the bureaucracy problems, it, so the investor might choose other places to invest. So looking forward, let's say if we manage uh, to develop the new industrial park, in the, for example, in the, uh, uh, next to the Penang, and then we manage to resolve the red tape issues, and we managed to bring high quality investment in various sectors. So I think in the next 10 years, uh, Perak can be a production hub for a &E, uh, and also for EV industry. Maybe uh, uh, 
Maybe we are not uh, better than Penang, but at least we can be a, at least on par with Penang and Selangor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You have painted a picture whereby 10 years down the road, with the commitment of government, political will, civil servants and industry, then all this can happen. Yes. So it sounds like all this commitment from all parties is a perpaduan commitment from all parties. Thank you. And I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Reza to share with us your picture of 2030. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, sorry, I, I, I need to use Tan Sri your point when, when he first mentioned about resetting the, 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 the economy. Yeah? Uh, when I first joined PKNP, semua orang may come to me nak propose nak buat rumah. So if I had worked with them to do the houses, we would have more houses in Perak than Selangor. Because Perak people are more than Selangor. No lah, I'm kidding lah. Mana ada? Okay, but, but that's crazy. Semua nak buat rumah. Now, how do we reset the economy? It's about bringing in new investments. It's about bringing in new private sector participation. Uh, with all the things that are being planned, I foresee that Perak will be playing a key role in becoming the next engine of growth for the north of Malaysia, uh, driven again by private sector invest, uh, investments, driven by uh, the special tax and non-tax incentives, and also strong industry academia collaboration. Uh, also, kita lupa, I think cakap pasal tourism. Now, a lot of people cakap pasal tourism, COVID, but we missed out the fact that we are rolling out I think Perak has uh, the first uh, 5G we roll out in the northern states. Yeah. Now, what kind of tourism would it attract? This kind of thing will attract these creatures called digital nomads. Yeah. Digital nomads ni, they're not internet, they suka language and culture, they suka climate, they suka leisure activities yang banyak, they suka security, safety, they suka a community of like-minded people, they suka uh, short distance to the accommodation and to the amenities. Didn't I just describe Ipoh to you? Betul kan? Uh, with 5G, I think the world is our oyster in terms of digital nomads. We have started talking to uh, NCIA, we started talking to MDEC uh, to actually launch uh, a, a path in this direction. So, uh, that's my, my vision. Lah. Wow, and, uh, this is a very powerful vision that by 2030, Pera is an engine of growth. I think Datuk Reza used the word in Northern uh, Peninsula, but it could well be the engine of growth for Malaysia in 10 years' time with all these sectors taking off. Thank you, Datuk Reza. Tan Sri. Thank you. As we, in the coming years, as we focus on bringing in tourism, FDIs, local investment, and many other things. I think the cumulative of all this is going to be a huge multiplier effect on the whole state, you know. You know, when you will be more hotels, there are more places open for uh, specialty food, there will be more eco-tourism going on. So it's a whole multiplier effect. People will find jobs here, People will buy more houses here. You know, it's the whole multiplier effect that is going to impact the whole of uh, Perak. I think one more thing is about uh, Perak we didn't talk very much about is food supply. Perak has got a lot of uh, lakes, a lot of water, even sandy soil, it doesn't matter. But I think we've got to give it to the right farmers to farm. Okay, And when they farm, they also may well develop specialty vegetables, better safety system for vegetables or special products. Huh? This will also have an impact on tourism also. Yeah. But I see the future is that as we starting may be slow, but like all things, you know, you start slow, then the accumulation of uh, the accumulation will be there, you know, more and more industry will come in. You, starting is hard but as more and more industry come in then you have an avalanche of uh, investors all wanting to come here yeah 
Thank you. Yes, uh, wow, thank you, Tansri. I can really see this picture. Well, you know, all this thing growing and therefore creating multiplier effect with a lot of abundance, including abundance of food, right? With that, thank you very much. I would like to invite everyone to join me to thank the three very distinguished speakers today. Thank you very much.